you know, it, we can start to begin to imagine a world where anything we could ever want is or need is accessible to us, and whole new classes of businesses and services that could start to provide a new kind of infrastructure. And um, in this panel today, we're going to look at um, this intersection between technology, the sharing economy, and the business models that actually support the true flowering of what this could represent, and uh, and explore a little bit different angles or perspectives that people are taking. And uh, we're lucky to have some uh, really wonderful people here on this panel, and uh, I'm going to let them uh, introduce themselves a little bit here. So um, we're going to start with, uh, with Paige. And so Paige, uh, can you tell us a little bit of your story, what you're working on right now, and what first drew you into this conversation at the intersection of technology and the future of business? So I'm Paige. I work for a company called MadeSafe. Um, and essentially, MadeSafe is building a new internet protocol which will uh, essentially facilitate its own ecosystem based on shared resources so shared storage and um, computing and bandwidth um, my introduction to the space um, mainly came from my interest in in liberation and freedom um, and using technology that to enable uh, individuals to gain power um, and kind of remove the the central powers that have been causing uh, many issues as we know there's large corporations and um, and banks and uh, specifically with the internet things like Google that tend to uh, just become very large entities that um, we become highly dependent on when we can depend more on each other, and I would like to see things like that. Um, yeah, maybe pass that one. So, um, so thank you very much, Paige. Really appreciate you. Um, so, um, Morgan, um, can you tell us a little bit about your story, what you're working on, and what kind of interests you about this conversation? Yeah, thanks. Uh, my name is Morgan Fitzgibbons. Um, I'm co-founder of the Wig Party. We work to make the area around the Wiggle, the bicycle route in San Francisco, more sustainable and more resilient. Um, also the co-founder of Free Space. Uh, his mission is to facilitate uh, creativity, community, and civic innovation through the gift of free space. Also co-founder of the Urban Eating League, which uh, Kendra specifically asked me to talk a little bit about, which I'll get into a little bit later. But basically, it's a uh, underground dinner. Um, uh, in, our, in our neighborhood, which is really fun. And uh, most recently, founder, co-founder of NOW, NOW Festival. It's a community festival. Uh, the mission is to, or the challenge is to co-create the best possible version of our community uh, for one extraordinary week. And I'm also adjunct professor at environmental, of, of environmental studies at the University of San Francisco. And I think what sort of got me in, interested in this space, the sharing economy, is actually really um, a group that's the subject of one of my classes at USF, which is a group called The Diggers which were, uh, were in the Haight-Ashbury from 1966 to 1968. And um, they've really been inspirational to all of my work. Um, and essentially their main program was to create a free community and then eventually a free city. Uh, so they gave away free food every day, had a free store, had free crash pads, inspired the free medical clinic, uh, free transportation, free churches, free bank, the whole thing. And um, their idea was to act out the world you wanted to create. Um, you know, they weren't interested in, in rallying and, and asking the mayor of your or, or you know, Congress to do anything. They just wanted to create what what they thought was a better, more beautiful world. Um, so they do your thing was their slogan. Uh, and if it's beautiful and righteous, hopefully people will do it along with you and it'll last for a long time. So they were really my big inspiration uh, in this work. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Maureen. Thank you for participating in this conversation today. So Sarah, um, thanks for joining us. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the things you're working on and are inspired by and what pulls you into this conversation around technology and sharing and the future of business? Can you hear me now? Great. Um, I started Pop Up Hood with um, another longtime Oakland resident in 2011 and what we are is a small business incubator revitalizing neighborhoods block by block. So
So our first inspiration was living in Oakland for 20 years and having the worst economy. Um, and Oakland gets hit hardest at first. And we saw um, the few creative people that had set up shop in 2008, 2009, starting to close their doors. And there was a 45% vacancy rate in downtown Oakland for commercial retail. So even though there was a lot of creative energy in, in Oakland at the time with the Art Murmur and First Fridays, and it was affordable and it was a great place to live, um, we weren't seeing that translating into jobs and it was looking um, like a ghost town So, in the daytime. Um, so the perceptions of safety were really impacted. So Papa Pud was a really um, a citizen-led urban prototyping project to take one block in Old Oakland and um, get the property owners to invest in businesses rather than buildings to spur economic growth. So we had uh, worked with the city, so we, we formulated this partnership with the city of Oakland and the property owner and ourselves and five businesses and we gave them six months free rent and marketed the hell out of them. And in three months, um, we sort of launched this neighborhood that was one of the oldest business sectors in Oakland from the 1890s. Um, and it has now become a destination and one of the first choices for new independent retail in Oakland. Um, and so our goal was pop up to permanent. And so we have five permanent stores now in an area that was really like third choice or nobody even knew about old Oakland. Um, so it was a very inspiring project that came out of the love of the city and out of the love of working with other creative entrepreneurs and reframing artists as entrepreneurs and independent business owners um, as, as opposed to just cultural um, workers on the margins of the economy. I'll get more into other tech stuff. Thank you very much, Sarah. Thanks for being a part of the conversation today. Drew, how are you doing? Welcome. Doing can you, great. Can you tell me a little bit about uh, what you're up to, what inspires you, and what draws you into this conversation about the intersection of technology and the future of the economy and sharing economy and all these things? Sure. Uh, my name is Drew Little. I'm originally from New Haven, Connecticut, now residing in Richmond, Virginia. Um, my background initially started off in sales and marketing and then eventually I got into like internet and new, new economy stuff through just learning about various thought leaders online and studying their work and trying to apply my own uh, spin or take on it. Um, the way I got into, oh my company, I started a company called Producia and basically with Producia we help organizations that caters towards creators such as like maker spaces, incubators, accelerators, co-working spaces. We help them build online maker spaces to help facilitate the whole idea the creation process. Um, the way I got into the new economy was um, in an unusual place. It started at a prison camp. I caught a conspiracy to distribute marijuana charge and it eventually led to me doing four months in the prison camp in Lewisburg, Pennsylvania. And while I was there, I noticed three things. I noticed the majority of uh, people's charges was based on money in some kind of way either the lack of it, which forced them to do certain things to make money, or greed. Um, the other thing was I noticed that they, they didn't have money in there, so they used fish packs and stamps as their currency inside there. And I was like, wow, how would that look on the outside? And, um, and once I got out, I just started, you know, deep diving into all these, uh, first started with social entrepreneurship. I learned about Muhammad Yunus with Grameen Bank. And I wanted to create like niche social networks for organizations, but I wanted to have a cause behind it, but I, I didn't know what to call it. So once I learned about social entrepreneurship, it took me down this rabbit hole of learning about cooperatives, mutual credit, to people like Tom Greco, um, other leaders. Um, so I learned about all the book. I learned about all these different concepts, and I wanted to write a book about it. I wanted to write a book about it, and it inspired me to create an economic model which I call producism, which is basically focusing on sustainable production and also based on open source principles, which I'll get to in a, in a moment. Um, and it also inspired me to go on a, uh, started off as a one year challenge, but ended up to a three year challenge. I call it the dream journey. I gave away 90% of my belongings to the homeless. I couch surfed at friends and family's homes. And the only way I brought in income was from, was from freelance work. 
And I wanted to show people how you can start with nothing and still build your dreams at the same time. You don't have to wait until everything's right and perfect. And I also wanted to live out the sharing economy compared to just seeing it from other people. I wanted to learn it and live it and then create a platform to show other people how they can you know, do the same thing. And that's what kind of produced it came about. And yeah, that's me. Thank you so much for being here, that's true. Um, so, you know, you actually started to touch on one of the things that's um, pretty interesting about uh, about the, the future of this, this economy that we're trying to create is that it, maybe it won't be built in the same way that we've built things in the past. Maybe it won't involve the same investment models. Maybe it'll involve different types of currencies, different types of architectures, structures. Um, and I'd like to explore that a little bit with some of the things that our panelists are working on. Um, I wonder, uh, actually, Morgan, um, if you'd be interested in telling us a little bit of, about um, how, how um, taking money out of the context for different types of exchanges and, and actually inviting a, a kind of a gift culture to start to become a part of what we're doing uh, in addition to uh, tra typical transactions or monetary transactions or even alternative currencies. Can you talk a little bit about about that and some how that plays into your summary work? Yeah, thanks, Edward. Um, so I think my presence on this panel is, is interesting and I, I'm, I'm excited to hear what the other uh, panelists have to say. Um, I think I might be a bit of an anomaly in that all of my work um, happens outside of the monetary system, essentially. Um, I'm basically nothing that I do, uh, we charge money to be a part of it. Um, and that's really core to um, the philosophy uh, that I take around around the work. Um, although there's one exception to that, and I'll, I'll get to that. But I think the idea of the, of the gift economy is the thing that's the really interesting part about the sharing economy. Um, obviously, we, we live and, and work and, and um, you know, rent, rent conference rooms in within this larger economy that you have to pay money for things, you have to pay money for rent, food costs money, you know, everything. Uh, we know how the old, the old system works. And um, I think it's interesting when people have really great ideas and great projects and they, um, they're always, I know some people that are always interested in, okay, we need to take this really great project and then have people pay us to do it because we need to prove that this is sustainable. Um, and to me, that's, that's taking the wrong tact. Um, I think it's much more interesting to do the work outside of the money system and get nothing for it and do it because also I think we can all agree that when you basically have to pay $10 to come into something that could be free, uh, that work's corrupted. It's just not as great as it could be. Um, and so, you know, and I also am sympathetic to the, to the realities of, okay, somebody's got to make a living and, and their time is worth something and all that kind of stuff. But if you can do something free, what you're doing is you're um, creating an inspiration. I, I was struck by what Drew said, you know, how he couch surfed and, and, and really wanted to show that you could do things outside of the normal system and still pursue all the great work. Um, and obviously, you know, I have to pay rent on my room and I'm very lucky uh, to have a job at USF that, that allows me to, to pay rent and, and get by. But um, I'm very conscious with all my work to have it be free, have it be a, of the gift economy um, because the hope, the idea, is that you create this such an amazing experience and and show what's what sort of stuff is possible that you inspire other people um, to either give the money that they have that's maybe they're they're able to give uh, because they have money or, or people are able to give their time to a project. So one project was that really embodied this really well is free space. Uh, this is a project where we basically took over a warehouse down in Soma for a couple months um, and we just turned it over to the community and we said, hey, we got this building, um, what do you want to do with it? And the only reason we could do that was because somebody gave us the building. You know, we have all these buildings, we have all these resources and they're not available to us because people are still stuck in the old paradigm that I need to have rent paid on this building for anybody to use this. Well, one guy said, you know what? Here you go. We're gonna give this to you, and yeah, his 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 ultimate you know his sort of reason for doing that was um, to hopefully bring attention and, and people to the space that hopefully he could rent it going forward. But the point is that he gave it to us. It was a gift of free space, and we turned around, we we gave our time and our energy, and and we gave it back to the community. 
Um, and, and it was the most inspiring two months that I've ever been a part of. Um, we did 220 events over two months in the space. It was a, it was a large space, 14,000 square feet. We had amazing murals. And really the secret sauce was that the, the space was there for civic innovation. So we say, hey, this, this project is our gift. This is what we're working on. This is our civic innovation. What are you gonna do within this space to come up with a project or an event or something that's gonna make your community better, your city better? Um, there is one exception to my to my no, you know, don't charge any money at the door rule, and that is the Urban Eating League, um, which actually does cost uh, $25 to participate. The way it works is we get five houses in our neighborhood to compete against each other to cook the best dinner and create the best overall experience around a theme. And then we get 30 people to sign up as the eaters. They pay the $25 and that, all that money goes to the food. Um, and that's, so I think that's it's still counts in, the, in that nobody's making money off of this, right? Um, and then over the, over the $25, they're giving um, their, their creativity. So eaters are also competing to have the best costumes around whatever the team is. So there's 10 teams of three. So, uh, you know, you're on a team with two other people. You go to all five houses, um, you sit down, you have these amazing meals, and, and you have these crazy experiences that people spend days figuring it out. So they're not having to pay for the food. That's why we, we make people pay to be a part of it, because otherwise it would be impossible to pull off. And so I think if you need to have money, it's okay if, if, if money is a prerequisite for just making it work. But, um, but people give their time and their creativity, and, um, and it's, it's, it's just the most magical thing that, that we do. And, and so you get to eat at five great places, you get to meet a lot of great people, you get to break bread with 15 different people overnight because you sit with a different team at each, each spot. And, um, and I just, it, it could charge $7,500 for this experience. And, and again, if we wanted to do this to make money, we could do it. But that's not what we're here to do. We're here to create amazing experiences for people and the hope is that you inspire people to move towards where we need to be. Thank you very much. Um, I, um, in, in, in thinking about some of these things and the intersection of the gift culture uh, and with alternative currencies and, and different types of incentives and infrastructures, I'm curious if, if Paige, um, is sometimes, sometimes as, as you're touching on, uh, you know, there's, it's hard to get around needing to intersect with uh, with money and, and charging and figuring out how that all works. Um, and sometimes we need to build pretty sophisticated infrastructures um, that take a lot of time and commitment and resources from uh, a variety of different people. Um, can you tell us a little bit, Paige, about some of the different ways that you've helped to incentivize the creation of relatively sophisticated uh, technological architectures um, through uh, different types of incentivization schemes that work in a distributed way? So um, I think it's important to touch on the fact that there's a key difference in scale. So something like MadeSafe is a global, uh, global system, whereas um, something like your project is very local. So therefore, the members participating are have a much stronger connection in this local sense. So it's really, in terms of creating these larger infrastructures, it's about um, making it work on a, on a larger scale and creating incentives for people to do good. Um, so um, the way that a lot of uh, cryptocurrencies and um, technologies that are being created now to kind of create these decentralized systems by issuing tokens. Um, it's really an interesting perspective uh, because you can kind of create your own currency or not being you're not being stuck to any individual currency even though say for example Bitcoin is a very popular cryptocurrency. Uh, made safe, the internet protocol will have its own currency. So there is still going to be a variety of different things. And there's also, there's actually um, another current cryptocurrency called, um, uh, it's based on uh, permaculture and it's um, kind of creating incentives to, um, uh, for communities to partake in permaculture type things. So, uh, however, with MadeSafe, since it, it is basing it on 
the internet, which is a global system, it's um, extremely important to kind of create this equalizing effect. Um, so it is really based on um, the, the basic resources that people are able to provide. So for example, in the network, if you only have a smartphone for access to the internet, you can partition a very small percentage of that to give to the network and then earn these tokens. It's not, um, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't really cut off at any one point. Thank you very much. Um, I want to actually um, ask uh, ask Drew if he wants to follow up a little bit and talk a little bit about how um, ecosystems of currency, um, whether it's social capital or cryptocurrency or, or different approaches, can actually create a kind of a, a resilient infrastructure uh, in, with respect to some of the things you've been pursuing. Uh, I think these ecosystems of currencies help people get access to resources when they're short on cash. And <clears throat> I think one of the biggest problems of our economic system is, or our, or excuse me, is that the barriers, to the uh, barriers to resources, tools, and communities of support. So if we can find ways to remove those barriers, I think we can have, you know, we can, we can uh, you know, lessen the wealth gap and help facilitate a lot of ideas to be manifested and things of that nature. Um, but these currencies need to be backed by something. And you got various things that these currencies, be, these currencies can be backed by, like you said, permaculture. You have uh, time-based currency that's based on people's time, labor, knowledge, um, unutilized goods. Um, I think <clears throat> I think currencies, cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and Freycoin and Litecoin, um, I think they're great. I think they're only one part or one half of the equation. Um, from research that I've done, I saw that in the Middle Ages they had like a dual currency system. So they had gold-based current, gold and silver, and gold was used for like long distance trade, and silver was based on local trade. And um, I think that's one of the problems I think with the currency system is it's like we're trying to find one currency to, dom to dominate the whole currency ecosystem. And I think you need a diversity of currencies the same way you you know have a diversity of of like plants and animals and, and forests things like that because if if you depend on one plant and that plant die in the forest then the whole forest falls down the same thing with, with currency if you know if uh, if if one currency if everybody's on, attached to one currency and something happens to that currency then everybody can you know can be you know uh, messed up in that way um, my work my work originally started focusing on currencies. But then I, I learned that that's only, currencies are only a, a means to a, a actual goal. So I was thinking, you know, how, how can we get people engaged? Because that's, that's something I learned too, is a lot of uh, currency systems, you know, one of the biggest problems is get people engaged around that currency system. And I, and I came across a concept called gamification. By a show of hands, who heard of gamification before? Okay. Well, for, for those who, who, who haven't, gamification is basically applying game con video game concepts to the real world to get people engaged around a particular you know theme or cause. And um, I heard this quote from this guy. His name is Gabe Zykerman, and he was saying games are the only way to get people to take predictable action without force. And here's an example of that: uh, Happy Hour. The bar doesn't force you to come there. You go there to get a, a discount on a drink, which is like a, actually a reward in a sense. And if a person or organization can keep uh, setting up these scenarios, they suddenly guide you on a journey without you actually thinking about it. Um, gamification is highly aligned with you know, uh, social engineering or behavior modification. And I think our minds are like computers and our habits are like programs. And uh, if you want, I think gamification is a great way of installing different habits in our brains. Uh, that's how a lot of people get addicted to video games because there's certain uh, incentives and mechanics and dynamics in, 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 in that game that get them to want to participate. And I was thinking like, how can we get people to want to participate in building a new economy? And first, as I learned from one of my advisors, Dan Robles, is people gotta to come together to create something. And that's where makerspaces come in. People come together to make stuff and imagine if you had a currency or a currency system within makerspaces. 
all around the world and had a kind of like an API system where these digital maker spaces and these creators can trade with each other. And that's where my work comes in. Um, we also, again, we help people build, we help organizations that cater towards organ, uh, creators, help them build uh, digital maker spaces. And you can have uh, like project management, social networking, a digital currency system on there with a marketplace. Um, you can have crowdfunding as well too. So all these different new economic concepts, I wanted to put them all into one platform and it's based on WordPress. A lot of people think WordPress is just only like blogging and stuff like that. It's turned into like a whole application framework. And um, I think close to 20% of the internet or more is powered by WordPress sites too. So I, I think uh, if the ecosystems of currencies was somehow related to places where people come to create, I think that can help uh, currency scale a lot faster and enable a lot more manifestation of ideas. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, there's a lot of threads. Um, I want to actually touch on something you, you 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 started with just at the just at the beginning around um, how 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 we have the conversations that start to enable us to make use of underutilized resources and figure out where they are and how they are. And I actually wanted to ask Sarah a question about, can you tell me like the story of um, some of your first conversations with like with the landlords who were the potential um, investors in these businesses uh, that had um, retail space that was unrented. Can you walk us through a little bit about your experience of um, of, of actually having having some of those first meetings and trying to get people on board with the idea that they would give away their space to try to create change that wouldn't just benefit them, but could potentially benefit a whole region or a whole neighborhood. Take us back to that moment. I'll give you a three-year arc. Yeah. Um, because that initial conversation was really hard because no one was having it. Yeah. So it was a totally... Um, it was a really new idea. And the only other precedents for that were um, in um, like creative art in storefronts. There was one company that was doing like creativity in storefronts in um, in Australia, mm -hmm. which we didn't know at the time, whom we later met and has been a great ally. Um, and then um, there was a couple organizations in New York that were partnering art in storefronts. Um, and Although my background is in art, um, I was doing public art, and then I was doing a lot of hackathons and using technology for civic engagement. Um, I was very invested in the creative community, but I was also very adamant that we would actually do, in Oakland, we would do retail um, that sold things so that people could make a living. And um, I just felt like Oakland's economy didn't have the luxury of, and we also didn't need more art and more creativity. It would, huge gallery district um, 10 blocks away. So I thought what was lacking was actually businesses really investing in downtown and, and the longevity of that and the, and giving all the cre creatives um, an outlet to sell their, their products. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of our early retailers, of course, 90% of the vendors were local makers. Um, so I was trying to kind of bring them into the economic conversation <laughs> of, of Oakland's like mm -hmm. making it through this depression and also just planting seeds for it to um, sustain itself. Mm -hmm. um, so developers um, have a very specific way of doing things and, um, and I don't feel like there are developers and investors and, and real estate people in this audience, but mm -hmm. if, you're, if you are here, Show yourself. <laughs> okay, I didn't think so. But um, kind of the role that we've taken on is becoming a bridge um, to, to that world that is really established, it's very bottom line, and um, there are very specific ways that their projects pencil out and make money. Um, fortunately for us, retail isn't one of them. <laughs> so they actually don't build these new buildings thinking that retail is gonna make money. Um, so that works in our favor. So the conversation was more like, sure, you could wait until you could, you know, attract big box retail. Like those are all the things that, that brokers and, and property owners do. Um, and there's they're incentivized not to, to take short term leases because 
if that subway knocks on their door, it's going to be rented out, they'll miss the 10-year lease. Um, so the whole system is sort of set up for, for long-term leases for the maximum amount of rent. So what makes Papa Put work and what, the, what was the kind of crowbar in the whole conversation was, well, the economy is the worst it's ever going to be. No one's coming to Oakland to open up a retail store at, of any kind. You know? um, so they kind of saw the writing on the wall and they were like, okay, we're willing to experiment. Of course, it was difficult because it, it was a total risk and it's a testament to the early partners that we had that they took that risk. Um, but we had the full backing of the city and, um, and that model now of giving away free space, we framed it as um, a community investment initiative and um, so there's a lot of data around how small businesses um, have a 68 cent to a dollar return um, that goes back into local communities. There's a lot of data about small businesses being the biggest growth sector in the United States. There's a lot of data about how 85% of them are women owned. Um, so the national data was sort of being expressed in this like one block experiment. <laughs> it was all women owned businesses. Um, they were totally investing in the community. Um, so, you know, the property owner, there are people too, and they got it. And so <laughs> they were like, yeah, it actually sounds kind of great. Um, it didn't hurt that um, we had, you know, just struck a chord um, and we got national press for these new businesses and then international press. So these businesses were really able to flourish and, and sign a long-term lease eventually. Um, so the hardline kind of argument now that we use is um, you know, developers now call us saying, hey, we want to do something different. We kind of like this idea of you know, um, having the ground floor that is going to attract like cooler, younger um, tech companies upstairs. They don't really want a subway. They don't really want another T-Mobile. They want to move to Oakland because Oakland is Oakland. And the retail is one of those places whenever you travel that you um, can really kind of, it's kind of your point of entry to the authenticity of the space, of the place that you're in. Um, it's the first thing people do is kind of walk around and look at retail shops. And so really to, for Oakland to start to have that daytime retail is it's actually a big deal. It hasn't really happened here in like 40 years. Um, so. But this model now is now a national model, and so large national developers are starting to kind of see this as an amenity that still they don't make money on, which still makes my job easier. <laughs> um, so they're not looking for the highest rent for the longest term lease. They're looking for an amenity that brings energy there, that um, has some kind of sustainability, but also they understand with the pop-up model that that turnover and that newness also, it brings energy as well. Um, and then, just to be bottom line, you know, in the first three months we did our project in Old Oakland, they already raised the rent for the office space 30 cents. So, um, for them, that's a really good return on investment. Um, so, you know, it's a total of 6,000 square feet that they gave away for six months. But the leases that they signed upstairs for office space, it really made sense. So the argument is that you know you can subsidize ground floor retail and do something exciting and interesting, even if it's temporary, um, but still make money and it works. It's a win-win for everyone. So you know, three years later, um, it's becoming now um, less of a push and and more that that's actually what um, they're desiring and. As, suburb, as the suburban model of real estate and how it's invested in is starting to shift into like urban infill. The urbanization of, of our retail is getting smaller and more unique. And I think that's a successful model for um, spaces that are vibrant and filled with young creative people. Um, and that's actually what's attracting you know, more people to live here. So it's, a, it's a becoming its own sort of ecosystem. Thank you so much. Um, I think um, I'm going to ask a question. Um, you know, you you, uh, you touched on something. Uh, and Drew also touched on it a little bit of the idea of like, you know, and I think it would be relevant for a number of us in this room, sort of 
taking a risk and believing in the possibility of a kind of a new a new way of doing things before the environment was ready and maybe before a lot of our friends and peers understood what we were doing. Um, and I bet a lot of us out here in the audience are also feeling like they might be taking certain types of risks. Um, would any of you guys like to share a little bit about some of the, the personal experiences that you might have had in in trying to step your own foot into this uh, into this new economy um, before a lot of the infrastructure is built out, and how how you kind of helped your help bolster yourself internally as as you might have been asking questions or or concerned about you. Anyone feel like that might be uh, something they'd like to answer? Uh, I can quickly follow up yeah. with. Um, I didn't really have, since I have a background in art, and I'm now in, um, spend a lot of time translating to international economic development specialists um, and uh, multiple cities across the US. Um, I'm working a lot on uh, state policy issues and talking to really large developers. Um, and it's not my background. <laughs> so. Um, but every time I go to a conference, I'm reminded, like, oh, thank God, it's not my background, because um, if it was, I wouldn't be able to think about these solutions so obliquely, and I wouldn't be able to transfer all the skills that I had into this new field as a social entrepreneur. And um, for example, my background in art makes me really, really good at telling stories, and that's all marketing is. Um, and it's something that the economic development professionals are just getting to. Um, so, but there are times when I was doing so much translation that I lost my own voice. And so when you're straddling like the old and new way, there's a pretty big chasm there and you just have to <laughs> really stay perseverant on your goals and find your allies because sometimes you're surrounded by a room of foreign objects. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Drew, do you want to tell us anything about um, about taking risks and what that's been like for you and what you'd recommend to others? Um, something that inspired me to take through that three-year uh, challenge was the book uh, Sid Arthur, seeing how he was kind of, uh, you know, in a place of privilege, and he once he left that palace, he saw like all the different poverty in the area, he wanted to go in the wilderness and kind of find himself. And, that was like an, uh, I want to do the same. Um, I kept, this was around when I, uh, when I learned about Muhammad Yunus, Muhammad Yunus's work with social entrepreneurship and I was like, wow, this is gonna be the future of enterprise because a lot of governments uh, have deficits and they can't provide certain uh, so, uh, services to citizens. And then there's also a need to create more jobs too. So I think social entrepreneurship you know, um, kills two birds with one stone where you create more jobs and you fill in the lack or you fill in the gap that uh, government and big corporations are no longer doing. Um, so that's one thing I just felt. And then uh, I saw this, a lot of people probably saw it too, The Secret, the documentary The Secret and learned about the law of attraction and seeing that play in your life. And at first it was scary because you talk about something or think about it and it happens like a day later or immediately and you're like, wow, this is just kind of scary. But then it starts happening over and over and over again and you just flow with it. So um, I think also too, um, starting with the why. So I started with the why I'm doing what I'm doing and that, that uh, inspired people to want to help you. Because I think before you ask for help, you not say get somebody's heart, but you touch somebody's heart first and then you, sh you know, kind of share what you're trying to accomplish with them. And once uh, I told that story, it opened people, opened people up to want to help me, and then by them helping me, by offering space or resources, I traded what I can, you know, my knowledge and resources that I had for them. So, like, for example, I had, like, a basement for, like, a year, and it was a couple that helped me out with that, and what I did for them is I helped develop and maintain their website form and offered all various forms of consulting and things like that, and it worked out, so uh, yeah, that's my little thing. Thank you. Um, we, uh, we actually have an opportunity now to open up a little bit to uh, hear some questions um, from you guys for a little while. Um, 
What uh, what is on on your mind that you'd love to, to hear about from either the panel in general or specific panelists? Um, go ahead, I'll repeat your question. What do you guys hope that the future of the sharing economy looks like in say a few years? Yeah, so um, the question question was what are you guys hoping for uh, in terms of the future of the sharing economy and what, what might you like to see uh, start to arise? Yeah, why don't you uh, take, us, take, uh, take that page. Um, I guess just more um, power to individuals, um, less concentration of uh, control and decentralizing it all. I think that's kind of the objective in all of this is um, finding a way to give people their individual power. Um, Why don't you use the other one? I think they both are kind of not Yeah, just uh, decentralizing the how we work with things. And um, I guess kind of to touch on the your previous question a little bit, um, I feel really inspired by concepts in nature and um, just looking at, um, I similarly come from an artist background. So I, I use that, um, that was kind of one of the things that threw me into thinking about concepts and looking at nature and realizing that nature evolved in a certain way and uh, what humans are kind of creating in uh, with corporations and large banks and everything centralizing just doesn't happen naturally and that we we need to be kind of looking more at, at how these systems have evolved in that way. So I think emulating nature is something that I would like to see the, uh, the sharing economy bring more so. I would, I would like to see um, in five years the sharing economy uh, have people giving money to people doing the good work um, instead of what I'm, I'm seeing the trend, which is people investing money because they're going to make a dollar out of it. Um, that's basically where the sharing economy companies are going, uh, the ones that are being successful. I mean, certainly not across the board, but um, it's being co-opted. Um, and I'd like to see people being inspired to actually support the things that are all actually about sharing and not about making money. I would love to see more uh, tech-based co-ops. So imagine if Facebook or Amazon was cooperative and you have all that wealth distributed to all the members and workers. What would that look like? Um, also scaling time making. So again, imagine Facebook got a billion members. Imagine you can trade a time-based currency with a billion people around the world. But doing that in a way with decentralized communities so the, or in a way of like decentralized or various maker spaces around the world again. So I look at like maker spaces are kind of, maybe I'm off with this, but like uh, back in the day they had guilds and these, these different creators came together and organized around that. Then he also has something, whoever, whoever heard of friendly societies? Okay, well basically it was like self-help communities and that's where insurance came from, where you say you have four different farmers, each farmer will put a certain amount of, small amount of money in a pot, and whenever, it's, if one of their farms got burned, they use that money to help replace it. Um, but the government you, like, took that model and applied it to welfare, when in 1933, when the whole Social Security Act came along. So I think we're coming, you know, uh, full circle, where now we can't depend on government to provide things that we need, if by, you know, by, uh, we need to depend on each other. Again, I think uh, technology is a great way to build that, uh, those connections. And that's another reason why we also like uh, targeting co uh, college students, because these campuses already have a communities of trust already built in. And I'll, I see a lot of time banks, maybe I'm off, because I'm, I'm not on the West Coast, I'm, much, I'm, in, I'm in Richmond, Virginia, but I see, from my research, I see a lot of time banks in smaller towns and a more of a um, more mature demographic, in a sense. I'd love to see that model come to millennials and see where would that go. You don't need to take any A quick one, um, because we're at the interesting intersection now where a lot of our online world and technology is intersecting with the physical space and experiences. And um, 
but we're behind in terms of policy to support that, and we're really behind in terms of our physical spaces. This is not an awesome room. So we're, built, we're not building to facilitate the types of interactions we want, and we're not designing uh, real world spaces, public plazas, retail spaces. We're not building flexible, iterative, cool, creative spaces. Um, and we're not financing them in the right ways to do that either. Um, and that goes back to how we're measuring our returns. But part of the, re the part of the reason why retail is still exciting is because people want these experiences and they want to they want to have um, an access to those makers. And retail is one place where you can do that. And retail that are starting to have a global reach, but in these really transitional underperforming neighborhoods, they can still survive because they're selling online. So there's this really interesting idea of like exporting localism and um, and also sharing like pretty lost traditions of makers that are coming back um, and, um, and getting behind the scenes and experiencing that in a way that you wouldn't know unless you had your Instagram and you're like, oh, there's, how does this get made? Like, so people who are doing this are starting to use technology and these social media tools to share um, this really creative, um, kind of older model of guilds and, and making things. Um, and that intersection is uh, few and far between, um, but I think we're starting to see them intersecting in like urban spaces and streets and some some shopping experiences, other other types of cultural events. Thank you, Marco. I saw you were uh, yeah, going for it. Thank you. Uh, so, so I, I love the model um, of uh, uh, revealing the ecosystem value of activities. You know, it's like we are we're all we have a hard time picking in systems, and uh, uh, you know, bringing in some activity in in a space creates a lot of value for the community. But in this particular case, it is because there was an income stream. You know, a way to make that visible uh, in a monetary term that allowed it to then be replicated and for people to be interested, right? So, I mean, that, you bring in some of this pop up thing, uh, and then they can rent for 30 cents more uh, the upstairs, right? And I'm wondering, can we uh, can we replicate models that create ecosystem benefits? I mean, ecosystem in a, in a wide sense, even in terms of the local economy, uh, even if we do not have a clear translation in financial terms. That, that's kind of, uh, in other words, uh, you know, would would that have been replicated even if we had not uh, been able to capture the financial benefits, or only somebody uh, was unable to capture the financial benefits? Or is that stream necessary to have this replicated? I'm going to repeat a little bit of that just for the uh, video audience back home. Um, so the question is, Sarah's model was able to unlock ecosystemic value um, that actually was ultimately translated into raised rents in some of the other uh, properties that the landlords owned, as well as kind of general office neighborhood space. benefit, yeah, the office space that they owned. Um, and that was a tangible financial benefit. But how do we start to think about um, ecosystem benefits that we can create through new models that don't necessarily have a one-to-one -one translation to a monetary stream that uh, that increases? That's a really good question, and there's two answers. One is that we've certainly looked at this model um, in other cities, rural cities, um, and the answer isn't always retail for a rural community, but the, the systematic thinking and sort of the building that ecosystem and the approach is, is a common denominator that can be adapted by a lot of local municipalities, actually, for um, not necessarily one-to-one -one economic benefit, but there's a lot of indirect benefits that happen. Um, and some of them aren't economic at all, but they get translated into economic benefit later. Um, that is a really uh, abstract thing to say. But um, for example, um, you know, like five years ago, you know, there was a lot of um, there was a lot of effort put into um, metrics and monitoring and, and reports around the in financial impact of arts in the community and art as an economic driver for 
for example, is a very intangible thing. Everybody knows it's awesome, but they don't really know how it's financially impacting a community. Um, so now that's sort of a, um, less of a question, and there's actual financial models um, built to fund communities to do art for economic benefit, and the, the funding cycle is structured so that they have to participate with the mayor's office to realize some of these projects. So it took five or six years for this really intangible thing to become institutionalized and then funded to, to catalyze and be replicated in every community. Um, and it gets expressed. Um, it's a really, like, the funding mechanism is really general, but it gets expressed in these really interesting, unique ways based on local communities. So, um, you know, a small town in Marysville that has, um, you know, the last Buddhist festival in the United States uh, can leverage this cultural and historical asset of this festival into economic benefit um, with this funding. So there are systematic approaches, but they really do depend on funding structures to, to sort of like catalyze them. So in other words, if you cannot find a uh, financial stream or economic stream coming out of it, it's very hard to replicate them. Because even the argument you made about the art, you're saying now we know that art provides economic benefits, and it is the economic benefit that allows that model to be replicated. And I was just uh, wondering if we as a society can do something, even if a uh, tangible economic benefit might not be there, to clarify, the benefit doesn't always have to be there. It's how it's funded from the front end can also determine the outcomes. And um, sometimes it, things are funded wrong, and so they don't end up, they have kind of a dead end, and they don't end up benefiting the community in the way that they could, um, I think. Um, but for a community to really maximize um, and leverage their existing assets, sometimes they don't think of them as part of their economic development strategy, and they absolutely could be. That's a very new concept. We have like urban designers coming in and doing economic development plans, but they may or may not have included the cultural, historical aspect of the community in that plan, and how really creative ways that the community can leverage that for economic benefit, like tourism or or including the community college into a program. So I think the thinking is becoming a lot more creative and specific to these communities to leverage these some difficult to replicate projects. That's one of, real quick. I, I appreciate your question, Marco. I, I would like to get to a point where we're not having to translate everything into an economic benefit. Um, and I think the, it's, a, it's a tough thing to do if you're trying to you gotta pay rent and you gotta make it all work. Um, but I think the core is shifting our worldview. The diggers talked about a free frame of reference. They had a giant picture frame that you would walk through, uh, and after you walked through it, you now could see the world in a free frame of reference and that you could act freely and do things for free. Um, and so it comes down to a worldview perspective. Right now we're in a particular worldview where people translate everything into economic benefit, and if we could shift that worldview, change the difference, change our stories, and all that kind of stuff, um, then, we, then it's possible, and I think it's a worthy goal. Yeah, um, yeah th I think that's one of our great cultural blind spots right now, is that um, if, it's, if, if we sort of mediate our lives by what generates economic output, the shape of this building, the way that the tiles are made, the, 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 you know, the, the way the streets are done, everything is sort of shaped by you know, the financial structures that brought them into existence, and, and that's what I hope we can start to evolve beyond. I'm gonna go to the gentleman in the checkered shirt uh, who's been waiting to ask the question. Well, I was actually gonna try and um, write something, but yeah, also, please. Uh, to partially answer your question, there, there, is a, there is a system, there's a way to uh, get at the solution of your um, I believe, um, and it comes down to two fundamental problems that have to do with um, like this uh, race storefront issue. So the, the main the main is one is called the time indivisibility, which is the problem of like they want to rent like a ten year lease at a really high rate, and they're fine with waiting five, ten, fifteen years for that lease to come along because the asset is appreciating in value each year. So the landlords are fine with waiting the fifteen years to get somebody who's going to get a ten year lease. Um, and 
they're sort of creating new models through which maybe you could say is transition to more of a decentralized economy, perhaps even a gift economy. Mm -hmm. So what degree do you think, and this is directed to all of us, I guess, um, we should be supporting those and see them as sort of like a necessary transition? Yeah, I, I think that's a great question. I mean, I was on a, a panel that Chelsea moderated um, a few months ago, and there's a, a gentleman who's working to basically bring the sharing economy concepts to Ford and American Eagle and, and these companies. And I think that's you know that's a that's a good step that they want to be involved in the sort of essence of it, which is which is the gift economy. Um, so that's exciting, uh, but I think we have to be careful that it doesn't sort of lose its value and lose its meaning in that process. Yeah, I think um, I think the, the there's we're seeing a Pretty, pretty extraordinary concentration of resources um, uh, in the sort of the name of the sharing economy. And everybody likes to beat up on like Uber and and uh, Airbnb, um, but I think it is sort of a it's it's a, it's an interesting cultural moment where we're seeing different ways to do things, and I think that the sort of the long run expression of that is going to. Uh, hopefully become more uh, collaborative, resilient, and non-extractive. Um, and I, I was heartened, I mean, some of you may know um, that Neil Gorenflo helped to convince, uh, I think it's South Korea, to not allow Uber to uh, to take foot, uh, or to, to set foot in South Korea for their own homegrown examples. Um, and uh, is that, was, was uh, that? I'm just shaking, I, I disagree. You I, disagree? I have no relationship. Uh, okay. I actually think they're. I, I think these for-profit sharing economy companies are doing more good than harm. Okay. Well, um, I think uh, I think that that's possible, and I also think it might be a transition state um, to uh, something a little bit more peer-to-peer uh, -peer and uh, resilient and non-extractive. And we will all get to see together. And uh, I appreciate you all joining us today in this in this inquiry. Um, I hope that you. Uh, feel like you've learned something and uh, that you got to uh, express something if you came here to do so. And I'm going to let yeah, Morgan know, say something. I know too. we're out of time. I was hoping we can maybe just do some quick parting shots. Yeah. Um, one is Now Festival's coming up uh, November 16th to 22nd. We're going to basically be doing 50 to 100 events in the Panhandle neighborhood. Um, you know, roller discos, free dinners, free flower giveaways, all that kind of good stuff. So you can check it out now. It's at .org and I got flyers. But I just wanted to kind of touch on a question I didn't get to answer, which is how do you, how do you, you know, you guys are all working on great projects and 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 some words of wisdom. Um, I talked to my students about the hate Ashbury and the hippies and how they, how are they able to change the world um, from their neighborhood and create this big movement. And I just really think that the, the sort of two key steps are one, first you have to believe that you can do it. Right? If you don't believe that you can do it, you, you, you can't do it. And then the second very, very important step is that you have to decide to do it. Sometimes people don't quite get there. They believe and they don't actually decide to do it. And the rest kind of takes care, care of itself. So in all your great projects, keep faith. And the other little slogan, if, if we are to have faith in the future, we must above all have faith in ourselves. Yeah. Believe in yourselves, everybody. Take risks. Let's build this thing together. Thank you all for coming.